Hello, I'm Claire Nazir. In this episode of Weather Snap, I talk to Dr. Michael Morgan, Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Environmental Observation and Prediction with the US-based National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. As regular listeners will know, one of NOAA's many responsibilities is to issue advance warnings of Atlantic storm and hurricane activity. Dr. Morgan recently visited the UK Met Office, ahead of a new initiative that aims to increase the sharing of expertise and data. But before we hear about that, here's more details about NOAA. NOAA was founded about 50 years ago. Its mission is to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, ocean and coast. It also has a mission to share that knowledge and information with others and provide equitable and actionable environmental information to decision makers as well as the public. We're not only a science agency, but we also have a regulatory mission as well. And part of that involves using that science to assess, conserve, manage coastal marine ecosystems and resources. We like to say that the reach of NOAA really extends from the surface of the sun to the ocean floor. I presume, like the Met Office, your communication as well as the science has evolved significantly since its early days, particularly now with where we're at with climate change. Yes. I mean, the the evolution of this really comes about because of the wealth of the observations that we have, the science that we've done to track and with some measure of continuity, not only global temperatures, but also the development of our predictive capabilities to understand how future climate is going to evolve. That has been part of our message in sort of communicating that there's a reality in climate change. We have records on Mauna Loa of the CO2 record, which show the increase in CO2. We have a scientific integrity policy, which really mandates that we have to stick to the science. And I think having that scientific integrity builds a bond of trust that we have with folks that use our information. And that, I think, helps ensure that our message is heard with clarity. How do you communicate the topic of climate change, particularly when we've had a summer like we've had, not only in the US, but in Europe as well? Part of that communication really is knowing the audience that we are addressing. So it's important to communicate the implications of climate change in terms of what the audience is going to understand, more specifically communicating how each of our lives may be impacted due to extreme weather events. One of NOAA's priorities, one of the pillars of its priorities is this notion of creating a climate ready nation. NOAA also has engaged in what we call climate and equity roundtables going across our country and looking at particular hazards like heat, like drought, and understanding how communities you know, the, the very different approaches communities have to take because there's unique geography and issues with regard to populations in different parts of our country. Let's just put this in context. It's the summer 2023 and it's been pretty alarming across much of the US in terms of the heat wave, which has affected in excess of 70 million people who had a huge amount of rain earlier on in the summer towards the northeast, again with flooding impacts. And then more recently, the the fires in Hawaii. How does your team respond to that? Because obviously you're immersed within the situation. We are really living in unprecedented times with the earth experiencing its hottest July in about 174 years. Our global average temperature is well above average. And we're also seeing a sea ice coverage hitting record lows. In the US, as you mentioned, we've had the flooding in Vermont earlier this summer. But we've also experienced in the southeastern United States along the coastal waters around Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, really intense, uh, very shallow, but very intense warming of the ocean surface. Some temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit several weeks ago. We try to understand what are some of the mechanisms for that. The very light winds, very light wind conditions um, inhibit significant mixing in the ocean. And so we get the very thin layer of very warm water, but that leads to coral reefs being decimated due to these extreme temperatures. Once the winds have picked up, we've got some mixing, those temperatures are dropped, but they're still unreasonably and unseasonably warm. And there's a continuity across all of these things. It's being able for NOAA and the within the forecast offices on the local scale to be able to communicate and give sufficient lead time to folks in the Northeast that experience the flooding, the folks around the Florida Peninsula to understand, one, we're monitoring these temperatures, we know what the impacts are going to be to those communities so that they could actually be ready to experience the impacts. And I presume you've accumulated a huge amount of data in regards to all these extreme events, which obviously will be ingested into your models 
to give us more insight into future events. On a yearly basis or throughout the year, what NOAA does is it tracks these what we call billion dollar disasters and they weight them based relative to inflation so that we're comparing apples to apples when we look across the decades. And what we're seeing across the United States is an increase in the number of these disasters. They're weather related or you may say climate related, but they're also related to where we live and work, how we build, where we plant. And so these disasters are flooding severe weather in terms of tornadoes and um, severe local storms, uh, coastal flooding impacts, hurricane landfalls. All of these we're seeing the increase in the number of damages associated with these at it's an arbitrary threshold of billion dollars. If someone's home is destroyed, it doesn't matter if it was a billion dollar disaster, they've lost property, hopefully not lost lives. And But we're keeping track of that because this is going to be an important record that allows us to communicate those impacts. But NOAA is really looking at its observing systems right now and thinking about ways that we can diversify them so we can get greater data. One of my roles within NOAA as Assistant Secretary for Environmental Observation and Prediction is looking at the process of how we collect observations and ultimately transform them into predictions of environmental hazards. Do you have extensive observation sites across the U.S.? There's a collection across some of the states in the United States, and we use some of this data, and we call them mesonets. They're very high-resolution networks across states like Oklahoma and New York State. Um, Maryland and Wisconsin are beginning to develop those. But we also have aircraft, ships, buoys, and facilities distributed around the United States and its territories that bring the science, the measurements, the observing capabilities in a global fashion to help contribute not only to our weather forecast, but to the whole enterprise of global numerical weather prediction. And we have an extensive collection of satellite observations from both geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit with our polar orbiting satellites. And the interesting thing there is we're really thinking as technology improves and the cost of launch begins to go down, new technology can be put onto these sensors. We're thinking about disaggregating some of our polar orbiting satellites so that we can be more agile in new missions to observe the Earth, um, we find that these polar orbiting satellites constitute about 85% of the input into our numerical weather forecast models. I mean, that is really just critical, isn't it? It's handling a huge amount of data. I know that we, you know, at the Met Office, we've been uh, working with machine learning and data science for a long time now, uh, but the, the computing capacity just keeps going up, which leads me very nicely on to the, the partnership which you forged with the UK Met Office, which is called the Transatlantic Data Science Academy. What can we learn the UK Met Office learn from you and then vice versa. What is it do you think that you excel at that we are really going to learn and and our, our, our partnership will, will add value that way? I think we have done a lot of work, again, in the impact-based decision support services. That's within our weather service. And we're also looking at that perhaps for our climate services. Uh, maybe over time, looking at our weather service offices being environmental information offices. So I think the work that we've done, as I mentioned before, with the social science community in understanding how to formulate messages which are most impactful is a place where the U.S., I think, really leads in uh, the communication of, for of our forecast. With respect to other technologies that we have, both at the Met Office and also at ECNWF, is really the growth of machine learning-based physical model emulators, which now are really low cost to run after they've been adequately trained and can reduce forecast at a quality that rivals our full physics models, maybe even exceeds them. And I think that's a place where we are rapidly beginning to put together a team ourselves at NOAA to really understand what those capabilities are. And we hope to share and learn with the Met Office how that process works. So this uh, initiative it has an academy associated with it where we're learning skill sets from your team and vice versa. What type of people do we attract? Obviously, I think it's changed very much since I became a meteorologist back in the early 90s. I think it's going to be the exploration and the exploitation, frankly, of what machine learning and AI can bring to us in terms of reducing the cost to generating a forecast. I come from an academic environment. I've been a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison since 1995. I'm on leave for it while I'm in this position. And I've seen many generations of students come through that have been excited about the atmosphere, excited about severe weather events, things of that sort. But prior to leaving, I saw an increasing number beginning to look at 
data science as a, another option um, to put in their toolkit. And I think we're going to see a new generation of meteorologists that are equipped with that and really ready to both interrogate the atmosphere, but also project the atmosphere forward using these tools. And so I think that's going to be an exciting future. So are you an optimist or a pessimist when it comes to climate change? I frankly think I can't afford to be a pessimist. I think we have to be optimistic about it. And I look at, again, coming from academic environment, seeing the students, their interest in their changing environment and understanding what can I do as a student? They're asking that question. What can they do to help serve their communities? They want to know how their communities are going to be impacted. They also want to know how they can help shape the future. And so I'm optimistic about it. I think the new um, innovations that are beginning to emerge across the sciences, I think are going to play a big role in our ability to confront these climate challenges. So solidly optimistic. Dr. Michael Morgan, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing how this new initiative between the NOAA and the UK Met Office evolves over the next few years. Great talking with you. Thank you. Another great weather snap, Claire. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Then you catch all of our daily weathers on YouTube as well. And if podcasts are your thing, check out our Met Office podcast channel. Lots of information, lots of stories there. And we'll see you again next week.